party. Now, there's a word you probably haven't heard in quite some time as we've all been in enforced hibernation thanks to all caps, the RONA. But back in the time before a party was when a group of mutual friends, family and sometimes strangers would gather to drink, dance, chat and make merry and sometimes sneak off for a cheeky snog in the back garden that the neighbour's cat took an almost perverse interest in. And maybe this is just me romanticising things because the current state of the world hasn't exactly allowed for parties for many months now and I'm sure that my humble reconstruction no doubt drew the ire of Karen across the way so I'm expecting a fine in the post any day now. Yeah I see you, Kurt and Twitcher. But I do remember that these things were often in the aid of a thing called fun. It's a thing that we used to have and they were often fueled by a heady cocktail of booze and music, but sometimes with a mix of friends and family and virtual, if not actual strangers, something was needed to get Weird Uncle Darren, Jill from Accounts and the sexy plate from the back garden all mingling together and that thing was games. And it's a tried and true formula that's been around for thousands of years, so roll with me as I explain party games. Party games began life as parlour games specifically designed to entertain large groups of people in social situations. And forms of parlour games could be traced all the way back to ancient Greece where they played a game called Copper Mosquito which you probably know and likely have played as a game called Blind Man's Bluff. Parlour games were popular for hundreds of years, especially around Christmas and doubly especially with wealthy landowners probably because it doesn't take a huge amount of time to own land. Though they were much less popular with the Puritans who actually banned Christmas for a few years. Great PR move, guys. Good job, I feel really sorry for your social media intern. Parlour games peaked during the Victorian era where they had their own version of Blind Man's Bluff called Squeak Piggy Squeak. They also had Hunt the Thimble, Wink Murder and Fictionary, which involved looking up obscure words in the dictionary and coming up with fake definitions for them. It's essentially what Balderdash is today. And my personal favourite, which is Snapdragon, which involved trying to take a raisin out of a burning bowl of brandy, which is less of a parlour game and more of a cut challenge from Fort Boyard. At the time, parlour games were very much DIY projects. They were spread by word of mouth. They used pencils and papers and items around the house. And in the case of one popular parlour game called The Sculpture, the bodies of the guests as you grab limbs and you pose them into guessable shapes. There was even a game called Are You There Moriarty where two blindfolded competitors lay face down on the floor and tried to hit each other with newspapers. <laughs> Do you remember when we thought the Victorians were dignified? I mean, you get all the flutter at the sight of an ankle, but you can twat each other in the head with a newspaper as much as you like. What a weird time. And as far back as mass printing goes, people were producing party games like the cards needed to play Oliver Twist, which was a precursor to Chase the Ace. The popularity of these boxed party games really spiked in 1920 and endured all the way up until 1960, where other multimedia distractions began to take root. And these boxed games would often repackage popular parlour games like charades with printed cards to take the effort out of coming up with loads of topics off the top of your head. And they're still popular now, although they've undergone a definite digital revolution. Look at the popular smartphone game Heads Up, which is a quick-fire repurposing of classic game celebrities. And thanks to its tried and true formula, still retains all the fun and frustration of grandma trying to guess what a Nicki Minaj is. And meanwhile, the app Piccolo has used the power of computing to do something truly worthy, generating mini drinking games. So whether it's chasing your mates around with a blindfold on or getting your auntie Agnes to hold an iPhone up to her head or grabbing a shriveled raisin from hot brandy, which definitely should be a euphemism, party games have been popular for thousands of years. But just why have they endured? Party games are great. I mean, especially for the owner of a business uh, where we have big groups come together, I think party games really are a good way to get people kind of get over the fear of playing new board games. Um, it's a good way to get social interaction. I grew up loving games like Taboo, Pictionary, um, things like that. There's some great new party games, Wavelength, some other things that have come out recently that we're a big fan of. Party games for me are a fantastic way to get to know my friends better, have really fun memories at parties. You know, sometimes if we are planning for the party to be around the party game, it works really well. 
but if the party's already going on, I don't necessarily want to take away from that current vibe to do a party game. You don't have to be particularly good at playing games, you don't have to learn the rules to uh, much of a degree. You just literally get around the table with your mates or your family or whoever it is, and you just have a good time. And it's quite a sort of old fashioned vibe that I guess was not dying out, but it was sort of, I guess people forgot how fun it was. The banter that goes on between people whilst they're playing them, I guess it's almost as much fun as the game itself. It's a good excuse to bring people together. So party games are popular because they're simple and yet they tend to be looked down on by hobby gamers entirely because they're simple, which is not simple. It's confusing. So the term party game typically comes with disparaging connotations, like it isn't actually a board game because it doesn't come with a phone book of rules and enough little bits of wood to choke a cave troll. Because for a large selection of hobby gamers, a game's substance lies in its complicated choices and multitudinous strategies. So compared to a game like Terraforming Mars, which looks like this, games like Pictionary serve to dumb down what the term board game actually means. And part of this push and pull comes from the rise of the quote unquote designer, like Klaus Tuber who designed Catan or Alexander Pfister who gave us the Great Western Trail. Whereas party games are pretty much handed down word of mouth for most of them, points don't even matter. I mean, in El Cranium has sold over 22 million copies and it's basically just Trivial Pursuit, Charades and Pictionary sellotaped together with a couple of riddles and Play-Doh thrown in. No wonder elitist gamers are getting in a bit of a huff about it. But you best not tell them about Are You There Moriarty. Over the years, the games we played at parties have morphed into the packaged party games we know today. And as board gaming in general has swollen to a $3 billion industry, party games are more and more prevalent. You can see that when you walk into any bookshop, ditto Forbidden Planet or Amazon. Not that you can walk into Amazon. When you go on Amazon, you know what I mean. You'll write it in the comments and I know you will. But the DNA of party games has remained unchanged though. It's just been codified with proper rule sets like Balderdash replacing Fictionary or the official boxed version of Pictionary or any of its myriad variations like Telestrations, Scrawl or Pictomania. Guess the traitor games like Mafia have morphed into Werewolf, The Resistance and countless other social deduction games, which has also become its own arm of board gaming altogether. And then yeah, Cranium has cornered the market by gluing every other parlor game together with Play-Doh. And that's without diving into branded social games like The Friends Game or The First Dates Game or the whole raft of game show based games like Pointless, Catchphrase, The Chase, The Wall, Tipping Point. What is tipping point? Clive, could they go together? Clive, it's gonna get close, Clive! Get it, Clive, you've done it! Oh, it's the least interesting thing from an arcade. Brilliant idea, guys. That's really gonna put it to Netflix, isn't it? And even YouTubers like Dan and Phil have brought out their own board game called Truth Bombs, which is designed to expose some home truths about your friends. Ooh. No one has ever done anything interesting, like a murder or reveals they're having an effect. I don't know. And there are just so many. And part of the idea of doing this Gaming Explained series was I was going to tell you what has become the industry standard for that type of game and what is the most popular now. But that is so hard to do for party games because of the sheer volume of them. Gaming Explained, breaking format points you didn't even know we had because I'm a Maverick. There have obviously been some mega hits in the party gaming world that you could point to as standards. Obviously, Cranium is a smash. It's sold 22 million copies in 20 years. Pictionary has sold 40 million. It's the top selling party game of all time and like the ninth most selling game in the world. But when was the last time you played it? Apples to Apples was a game about putting together a random question with a random answer using cards and hoping to create something funny. And if that mechanism sounds familiar to you, it's because about 10 years ago, a startup company put out a copy of that game, but with edgy adult questions. And that became the most popular game in the world. So let's talk 
about this black box. Cards Against Humanity is basically an explicit version of Apples to Apples. One player puts forward a question on a black card that might be, what's that smell? What's a girl's best friend? And I drink to forget about blank. And then the other players put forward an answer on a white card and whoever gets the biggest laugh wins. For example, I drink to forget about the past. Fitting this moment in time, right now. It's a game that purposefully encourages its players to be offensive, and like the black box would suggest, it strives to gain a reputation as the black sheep of the board gaming world, the bad boy. Not exactly the sort of bad boy who breaks the law, but the bad boy who kept getting his bum out in class. The game was created by eight friends from Illinois who met in high school. It was originally called Kardenfreude, after the term Schadenfreude, which is the German expression for shameful laughter or finding amusement in suffering or unfortunate circumstances. It was kickstarted in 2011 and one month after public release became the top selling game on Amazon. In just two years, the game had generated over $10 million in revenue. It's had five main editions, six official expansions, dozens of micro expansions, a product called Please Do Not Buy This Product, which was a 69 inches long Cards Against Humanity box containing a single card, proof if nothing else that Cards Against Humanity is so successful that it's made tit around money. But what do gamers think of it? Cards Against Humanity brings out the worst in people and I absolutely love that. For about two hours you get a a judgment-free zone where you can let all the darkness out of your soul. It's fun. A good game in the sense that it kind of was a gateway to many other party games. And for honestly, for me in high school, it's what got me back into board gaming. But uh, uh, it's, <laughs> it's a bit unfortunate um, that people think that just putting two things together means that suddenly you're really funny and that you're a really funny, clever person. Uh, when, you know, if you struggle with being confident and being funny, there are other games that allow you to actually still be creative. Um, Telestrations, I think, is a great example of something that if you're not a super confident person, you will still find something funny to create through your other friends as well. That's a party game that is very controversial, you know, um, as far as the cards that are involved, some things, some people get offended. I don't have a problem with it if people want to play that game and they enjoy playing that game. Um, I've had my fill of it a long time ago. I think the first few times I played it, it was fun. We were very drunk and that was funny, but after that, it kind of got boring to me. I mean, open the doors to loads of other uh, game publishers who had slightly sort of adult, risque, sort of slightly naughty games in their locker to be taken seriously by retailers so retailers wouldn't like touch some of these you know some get we invented a couple of games that they're just like we cannot put that on our shelf certainly not you know john lewis going no 100 percent not putting you know we had like bucket of doom you know when the shit is the fan you need a plan it's the line on it and they were like that is absolutely not going on our shelf so we were like Okay, but look, look at cards against, cards against Humanity. I mean, you stop that, and okay, it's not rude on the front, but you know, the content inside is you know, it's pretty out there. I think it also brought back loads of adults who felt games weren't really for them, they were more for kids, so they suddenly realised actually games are much more adult these days. Um, but actually as a game itself, uh, I, I don't actually think, you know, it, it's not really, I don't even, wouldn't even class it as a game really, because there's nothing, there's no element of really luck, skill, or venom. If you if you're measuring, if we sort of measure our games by those by those three things. On BoardGameGeek.com, which is the IMDb of board gaming, a database for user scores and official reviews, Cards Against Humanity has a 5.9 rating, which is uh, it's not it's not great. In comparison, Monopoly has a 4.4 because people really hate it. Me included, I think it's absolutely. We played it this afternoon. Go check out Luke's video to see how much of an absolute war of attrition that game is. We've looked at the most popular party game that regular people are playing right now, but the final part of explaining party games from all sides, and especially for those trying to get into board gaming right now, is to look at what gamers already inside the hobby are playing the most. Despite the general sense of elitism within board gaming that quality equals complexity, there are some deeply beloved party games within the hobby right now. 
Just One is a super light, super silly co-op game that last year won the Spiel de Jahres, the board gaming equivalent of the Best Picture Oscar. Dixit and Mysterium, both of which are sort of like charades but using crazy abstract art to communicate with, have been huge successes. But without a doubt, the biggest game of the last few years is Codenames by designer Vlada Chivartel. It's a team game where you have to link words together using clues in order for your teammates to guess them. But the tricky part is avoiding guessing the words of the opposing team, wasting a pick on a neutral word, or the dreaded assassin card, which instantly loses you the game. It's all about communicating and getting on the same wavelength as other players with a nice element of risk reward because you can make your words broader and hopefully score more words on your board, but there's always that element of risk that you might have accidentally hoovered up one of the opposing team's word in an avenue of thinking you hadn't have thought of. Unlike its spy stylings, Codenames has been drawing plenty of attention to itself since release, winning the Spiel de Jahres in 2016, selling 1 million copies of its original version, becoming the number one ranked party game on Board Game Geek. It's even had a two-player spin-off called Codenames Duet. It's had Marvel, Disney, Simpsons, Harry Potter versions, if those are markers for success. It's even had a pictures-only version, which is rubbish. And it's had an adult version using words like bum and penis. You know, essentially, Codenames Against Humanity. But what do our gamers think? Codenames, I think, is really fun. I like uh, the idea of Codenames Duet a little bit more. I like the co-op nature of that and the two-player version of that. Um, but Codenames can be a great game. It can be very kind of thinky, or it can be just kind of a fun party game. So it kind of teeters between the two, which I really enjoy. It allows you to get to know either people that you already know really well even better, or if you don't know the people that you're playing with at all, it allows you to get to know what they're interested in and you know, how their brain works a bit better. Um, the only issue with it is that it does work so much better with even numbers of people, so you do have to have a very specific amount of people to play it. Author Richard Lingard said you can discover more about a person in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. Party games are informative. They don't just teach us things we didn't know about our fellow players, like Never Have I Ever, but they teach us about the content of their character. Are they competitive? Mischievous? A team player? Also, how do they think? How do they interpret, intuit, and impart information? What are their cultural reference points? Why do they think this means a Star Wars? and it obviously means Battlestar Galactica. They're about communication between each other. The most popular party game in the world right now is about smashing offensive concepts together to form social bonds and have a laugh about things that usually repel people. The biggest selling party game of all time is about trying to communicate ideas visually and enjoying and reveling in the failure to do so. Whereas the gamer's choice is all about working together and again, using language and groupthink in order to link words and ideas. Party games are all geared around a moment of bond, slight shining moments of cohesion where someone puts an idea out there, an extension of themselves and you pick it up. And funny are those moments of disconnection between intention and communication. Fundamentally, we're a tribal species and we're compelled to find moments where we all think like one. And for all of their simplicity, party games appeal to the primal need to gather, celebrate, and crucially, be understood. Thank you for watching this, our very first episode of Board Games Explained, one of our weekly series here on Phenomena Nerds. If you like the video, give us a like, leave a comment telling us what your favorite party game is, and subscribe to the channel for more awesome board gaming content like this list, 10 great party games to start your collection with. So if you were inspired by this episode, that's a brilliant place to go and find out which games should be in your collection. I've been Laurie Blake, this has been Phenomena Nerds, get on board.